So today my talk is 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 called Art for Our Sake, a Well-Being Divergence. And I'm going to do my best to keep us on time because I, I was told I have 20 minutes. So I will begin and uh, jump in and then um, if someone can signal me, signal me when we're about two minutes out, I will uh, stay on top of this. So build back better. If I had my PowerPoint, you'd see a gigantic question mark there. I want to start from this premise. As we languish in the roller coaster of emotions that is this continuing pandemic, public discourse focused on, quote, building back better, and this is at the city level, has proven itself impoverished with the terms um, normally circulated, you know, at, without a level of criticality. So undoubtedly, we want to see the arts sector flourish again. But when one reads the various recover and rebuild plans at multiple governmental levels, many critical questions arise for me. Um, and it's not just because of what is said, but mainly what is not said. Without listing a long collection of complaints, I want to simply note the language and positioning of governmental responses uh, and I want to note directions we might imagine to move with or without governmental collaboration. Organizations and organizations in the arts are rightly looking at their boards um, as they believe this is one place where diverse representation might signal a kind of visual rebrand believed to be quote unquote progress. But I want to zoom uh, out from this discourse and then zoom back in at a more individual level. So what is missing from this language? Well, our federal budget, the 2021 uh, recovery plan for jobs, growth and resilience, maybe in that order, for me is, is uh, exemplary in the impoverishment of this public discourse around what we could be doing to create a different kind of society, rebuild something that we don't have knowledge of just yet. So in this plan, uh, there is a quote, robust economic, re a desire for robust economic recovery. Um, and, and I, you know, if this was a visual, I would have it, you know, in the same sentence with a verses here. So a robust economic recovery, and they also want to address systemic racism in our society. So as someone who has spent decades studying the African diaspora and living, I find these two phrases obviously, um, not, not obviously, but contradictory in a sense. Um, and I don't see how they can um, be disentangled such as we, you know, to be different kinds of goals, right? So the, the phrasing of it to me already suggests that there is no relationship between the economy and systemic racism, which we know is not accurate. Um, another part of the plan also asked, this is again, the federal budget, the 2021 budget, and it quotes to rev revitalizing Canada's tourism sector through 1 billion to help tourism businesses recover and support festivals and cultural events that provide jobs and growth in many of our cities and communities. Additionally, this budget will provide 300 million over two years to Canadian Heritage to set up a recovery fund for the arts, um, culture, heritage, and sports sector. So what I find uh, you know, amazing about this language is to go back to this idea of we can address systemic racism without understanding its connection to the economy. And I'm going to dive into this deeper as, as, as I, I um, move forward, but I want to hold those, those two things in tension because I would argue that economic recovery, recovery can and will reproduce a certain level of systemic racism in the society as long as our analysis remains a reductive one at an economic level or, or, or a simply a financial one. So clearly we know the art sector needs to be addressed. Um, but the questions, the way that it's phrased actually hinders the kinds of questions that we could ask, because one might argue, um, coming out, especially out of the last panel, that 
arts festivals, uh, cultural events, you, you know, they're, they provide more than just jobs and growth. So growth, for example, is really in, in, this, in this instance, in this budget, growth is only understood in economic terms. Similarly, in the title of the budget, the last word resilience, resilience is also referring to a resilient economy, an economy that doesn't necessarily lose or shed as many jobs. I want to argue that there's much more missing from this conversation. Um, when we talk about economic devastation, there's at the individual level, um, at the interpersonal level, at the psychosocial level, there's uh, a depletion of individual artistics, art, artist networks. There's a depletion of not just our spirit, but our, our, um, our networks. And there, there is uh, a moment in which one needs to replenish um, artistically, creatively, emotionally, spiritually, that can't, it cannot be done in the budget. Although the budget gets touted as, uh, um, you know, with savior-like residues of what will make things quote unquote better again. Now, for me to just zero in on the federal budget and its language would obscure what else is happening uh, at other governmental levels. And, I'll, and I would argue that one of the things that's happening, not so much at the city level, but more at the provincial level, is that arts councils are constantly having to um, demonstrate that they have value to a government who is whose job is to fund these agencies, right? So while arts councils are compelled to articulate their value to the economy, Something else is happening um, at the same time. What's happening is that, you know, we can all speak about um, the arts in Ontario contributing $26.7 billion to the Ontario economy. We can talk about the, the GDP, the provincial GDP being bolstered by three and a half percent by the kinds of research that, um, you know, that arts councils have been circulating and this is a necessary evil in order to continue to um, convince ministers and other power brokers that you know when you want to stimulate the economy you have to you know one should think about funding arts and 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 creative cultures but there's something else also going on as the recipients and the the public that reads these reports um, and the reports are designed to uh, help shore up future funding opportunities or to ensure that the government looks favorably onto these arm's length agencies is that the language, the economic language begins to obscure all of the other really critical and important parts of what the arts and culture do. Um, and this importance then is magnified exponentially for racialized communities. And this is for for this audience. I don't really feel like I need to go uh, deep into that, but we understand that you know if the unemployment rate is is nine point seven percent, we know for racialized people the unemployment rate is actually seventeen point eight or something double what it would be for um, this the society in general. So the mainstream. So so what I want to suggest is that the the economic analysis of art continuously gets repeated and becomes part of public discourse. It becomes normalized in a sense so that we actually lose our ability and even the desire to do research and to understand uh, multiple impacts of the arts, not only not just because we uh, it's being obscured, but also because there's an urgency to continue our funding relationships with, um, with governmental bodies and those that can make sure that uh, arts councils get their money increased, at least alongside with inflation, which is often not what's happening. Um, at, it hasn't happened uh, at the provincial level up until maybe two years ago. It had been flatlined for about nine years. So I want to suggest that while this is happening in public discourse, while the arts and our understanding of arts and culture is becoming overdetermined by language that's that's economic and in, in, in its focus, there's something else that's also happening in the digital world. And I wanna turn my attention to that because in the, in the first half of this year, it's really been amplified that the mainstreaming of blockchain has uh, helped to flood the digital art world 
um, with profiteers and speculators who's, who, who have now influenced the development of crypto art and the circulation of cryptocurrencies. Um, while the media frenzy back in January reported on artists, quote unquote, getting rich quickly, the fringes of this conversation are more important to the majority of artists. And I go here because this language are, is not mainstream in, in, in the arts world in Canada. And you know, uh, Canada Council is trying to stimulate this kind of conversation through their, through their digital arts funding um, and some of their new opportunities, but it's, it's slowly emerging. And on the fringes of the, of the conversation around um, blockchain and AI technology, artificial intelligence, um, is um, a couple of um, folks that are, are, are having really important conversations about, some, about something more than just getting rich, right? So the world of, of non-fungible tokens, also called NFTs, allows artists to lock in a percentage of each of the resale of their digital asset by entering ownership details and rules into each sale of each sale into a smart contract. Um, and then this is entered into a decentralized global ledger. So what is happening in the, in the virtual world is really the art at, um, at the public art market is really being completely disrupted by these um, smart contracts, digi digi digital automated contracts that can happen online, that can ensure that um, you can verify the authenticity of a piece of art, but you can also, um, you, the artist can decide, you know, maybe they, wanna, they want to give each gallery um, a percentage cut of, of each sale of their artwork. And I use this example because it's really intricate. An artist could say, uh, this art gallery, I want the gallery attendance and the security to receive a portion of the sale of the artwork. Um, and that can be written directly into a smart contract. And that really dramatically changes the relationships of power, particularly in the arts world. So I, uh, switching more now uh, to music, and I'm gonna bring this all back in a second. Musicians are beginning to lock in share splits of their royalties and they're also incentivizing fans to become future concert goers. They're using blockchain technology and various virtual uh, auction spaces or, or, or platforms um, to create new kinds of experiences for their fans, knowing that when the world starts up again, they, they might be able to have concerts, but they're going to have to find new ways to lure in their, their fan base to new experiences. For these fields, the public art world, uh, the public art gallery world and, and musicians, uh, and for many other fields in the arts, we need to be able to read beyond the headlines, beyond the uh, artists are getting rich very quickly by selling digital memes, for example, which is, you know, these I could ad nauseum could rehearse some of the headlines that were rampant in January and February of this year. Um, and I, I wanna shift and suggest that while that conversation is happening, um, and the media is focused on, on their headlines, there, there is the opportunity to move towards more self-defined notions of one's artwork and what happens to the artwork when it goes out into the world through um, virtual platforms. And I wanna suggest that one could, um, in this moment, in, in what's happening in the virtual world, focus on notions of wellness, um, data sovereignty and data justice and this can be done and embedded into digital technologies, into uh, digital assets of various artistic experiences and, and performances. We're, on, we're just on the cusp of this. Now, why do I mention this? Because in some way, what's happening in, in the virtual world is a, is a complete intensification of capital, right? We're finding people that are um, hoarding digital assets because they wanna liquidate their cryptocurrencies, right? And if that's not an intensification of, 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 of capital, then nothing is. So why focus in this way? Because on the fringes of that conversation are artists that are being empowered outside of the record label, outside of their, you know, the art gallery that represents them. And they're leveraging this technology to actually uh, to personalize the direction in which the art, their art will go. Why does that matter? Because we are all not visual artists and we're not all musicians touring and, and having concerts. Because I wanna suggest that the work that lays ahead beyond the governmental language of uh, rebuild or um, robust economies, I think the work that lies ahead is, is a certain kind of decommodifying work. And what do I mean by that? Um, I wrote a paper um, 
for UNESCO earlier this year and for the majority of last year. And I wanted to think through this idea of what happened, particularly to Black arts cultures globally before this moment, before Canada was a country, before um, multiple uh, waves of diasporas actually enriched the cultural fabric of this country. So I wanted, I wanted to think about what did art do in other places and what could we imagine art to do after this moment or during this moment when we are thinking about rebuilding because maybe we might want to rebuild something that is different than the economy that we are stuck in or we're stuck in that got us to this moment of of uh, heightened inequality so one of the things that i did in this in this paper and i will sort of just give you some quick excerpts is i, I turned back to somewhere like salvador uh, de bahia in brazil which was it's in the 1500s, it was this capital city and it was somewhere where the Portuguese colonizers sort of brought, um, as, you, as many people know, uh, millions of Africans to. So if we turn to this place in Salvador, this is the home of Samba music. Um, and it's in Brazil's Northeast, um, um, in one of its Northeastern states. And the criminalization of samba music quite early on before it migrated to Rio de Janeiro and when it got to Rio alongside with the the criminalization of capoeira which is a, a martial arts dance you know it was outlawed in 1890 and today it's one of one of the country's most celebrated cultural exports unfortunately within the sort of tourism sector um and what I want to suggest is that the power, the governmental power that's exercised on art forms, and the two examples I just gave you here, samba and capoeira, um, and many other art forms that, that come out of the African diaspora, I want to suggest that the, the governmental power that was exercised on these forms, um, they, A, didn't limit the ways in which these forms, uh, these art forms were able to impact and positively enhance the development opportunities of, of Africans in Brazil in this particular uh, example. Um, and they, they couldn't, the governmental power also could not eliminate, they couldn't destroy um, these art forms that they tried so hard to. So by, you know, by 1890, you had more than a hundred years of capoeira being practiced that you weren't able to destroy. That also might make us wanna question or ask, you know, what are the governmental priorities around arts and culture? And are they actually in the uh, thinking about the well-being of the practitioners of these art forms? So still going back to history, I want to suggest that our understanding of arts in the African diaspora and its relationship to contemporary indexes around social around social cohesion, civic engagement, um, belonging, etc. It's murky today because historically the the, his, the sociological work and, the, and and even what the work historians do on Cuban cabildos, which were their brotherhoods that were critical to their forms of carnival, uh, Brazilian samba schools and Trinidadian panyards, for example, and 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 the tents that you'd find in in um, Trinidad carnival. These are all rich places where culture and arts developed outside of, um, you know outside of being persecuted or while being persecuted by the government, I want to suggest that we have no idea how the arts, or we don't have an intimate idea of how the arts can be beneficial to human development, largely because historically, not only have these things been outlawed, but um, the government's attempts have never been focused on how to leverage these art forms for the benefit of the, of the human populations. So for Western nations, particularly those that have benefited from benefited from free black labor and continue to be home to generations of Afro diaspora people, there, we don't have any metrics focused on human development uh, for these particular groups. And I, I say this because I'm suggesting that if we we want to reposition the language around funding and arts and, and creativity during this pandemic, during the rebuild beyond uh, you know mass vaccination. I want to suggest that we have to dig deeper for some tools and repositionings to think about the, how the arts and culture, how arts and culture have an impact on, on individual well-being, um, and how they might be, how we might try to augment or transform the metrics designed by arts funders um, 
so that we're not we're looking at something more than just the qualitative but the qualitative correlated to indexes around human human development So I think at the at the some of the highest levels of, of government, we're, they can't have these conversations around the importance of arts. And in my example here, where my focus is on the, in the African diaspora, I don't think we can, you know, these governments don't have the necessary uh, tools nor desire to think about what might be the role of the arts in, in, in um, continuing to support the development of, of Afro diaspora communities. Yet we know um, from our own experiences as practicing artists, as, as, as administrators, as researchers and as thinkers, um, as performers, that the arts are critical to the mitigation of anti-Black racism um, and some of the very anti-human structures that drive corporations. And we know this from practicing and doing and living art, but we haven't found a way to translate this into a public discourse that can speak back to uh, the dominance of economic rationalizations of everything we do. Um, and, and, and we need it to also not just speak back, but to continue to mitigate and operate as tools by which we might make decisions about programming festivals, about uh, accessibility and who how to think about um, ways in which groups can benefit from your performance or your festival or the or the art that you make um, in ways that don't necessarily reproduce or reify the, the the commodification and the quantification of human life um, so the example that i that i provided here is that i want i, I want to suggest that we need a paradigm shift that moves us away from arts for our sake Arts for art's sake, right? Which is one of these really old terms that that uh, I've been wrestling with to think about what is art for our sake look like? Art for, and you could fill in a number of blanks beyond art for, you know, a career, but you know, practicing art part time for the preservation of stories, or for the pre preservation of funeral songs, or art for um, the reduction of isolation art for a bunch of different kinds of things that aren't necessarily about uh, number of bums in seats, uh, num number of social engagements on, on digital platforms. There's all these kind of metrics that lead us down a road to continue to reproduce the conditions under which um, our lives and our art get commodified. So I'm really pushing for this, a sense of a decommodifying turn a turn in which we try to decommodify the culture and the art that we produce so that we have a different analysis of the role and impact and where what the art and creative works can do. So the common notion of art for art's sake um, or as a cultural product then it, it is problematic because we need to be thinking about art for our sake in ways in which uh, psycho and social opportunities for development, for healing, for growth are embedded in that theater's performance or embedded in, you know, our, the public, um, you know, dance, dancing sessions that might develop out of someone's art um, or, so, or um, a dance company's work. So where to look for this uh, decommodifying a turn or where are we trying to, where are, where is there significant force, force being pushed? And I wanna suggest that there are a couple different places where we might look. So, Again, I'm going to one of the obvious places we might look is where we, we would hope thought leadership would exist is is in Canada Council's new strategic plan. Um, where they are focused on one of their strategic directions is, is building the set the sector on a more inclusive, equitable and sustainable foundation. So for me, this is one of the first places when it came out a couple of weeks ago, I was hoping that we would see you know, some sort of indication that there's tools here that we can work with to build, not build back better, but redesign um, with equity and, and artists at the center of what we're trying to create. So to quote the strategic direction, one of the strategic directions from Canada Council's new plan is to, is, uh, here's the quote, 
Many of the art sector's shortcomings, inconsistencies, and injustices have also come into sharper focus since the spring of 2020. So this is an introduction into, um, into one of the strategic directions that I listed above. The quote continues, the report continues. We now have an increased awareness of systemic barriers that lead to a persistent lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the arts, particularly in the workforce and the, and the programming of far too many public funded, publicly funded organizations. This has limited the participation and advancement of artists from underserved and marginalized groups. And I won't continue reading this. I'm sure many of you have read this before. Now, my question though, and where I struggle is that this report can mention, you know, things have become sharper into sharper focus since the spring of 2020. And we know that the reference is to May 25th when George Floyd was um, murdered, you know, lynched in front of publicly in front of people. Um, and we know that that moment happened, but when we go through this report, there's obviously something at stake to mentioning anti-black racism. So if our if our if our prime minister has come out and said after so much prodding that anti-black racism exists, why is it that we our federal funder can't they can rely on the context in which black life is taken in, in which black death is a necessary precondition for transformation in the society, but we cannot get anti-black racism mentioned in the strategic plan, right? Uh, we have the mentioning of all the priority groups according to the funder. What this suggests to me though, the inability to say anti-black racism is one of the levers that is encouraging us to transform the sector suggests to me that the best interests of the black communities are not necessarily um, drivers in the new strategic directions. So without trying to indict a federal funder, I wanna suggest that the work that we must do is investing in approaches um, around inclusion and social equity that don't necessarily rely on these funding bodies or governmental organizations, including Canadian Heritage and others, that we have to, from the ground up, push and push on the dominance of, of sort of an economic rationalization of, of all the work that we do and push towards not just decommodifying our art forms and our artistic lives, but pushing toward the notion of well-being that centers the artist uh, and all of their relationalities in an ecosystem so that we can support the development of these human beings who will make art and not just fund their art or not just support the outputs of all of the labor that goes in there. So one of the groups that's, that's, that's pushing in a different direction is called the Racial Equity Media Collective. They've been lobbying the government on Bill C-10, an act to amend the Broadcasting Act and make related and consequential amendments to other acts. Um, so the, the Racial Equality Media Collective, for example, they're, they're asking or demanding for mandatory race-based data collection. We saw that fight slowly be won over the, the, the pandemic recently. Um, they are asking and demanding for equity oversight in the in, in sort of the broadcasting world and the screen media world um, and more BIPOC content and ownership, right? We just don't need to see ourselves. We also need to own, own the, the, the materials and the means of production so we can make the decisions that are best for us. Um, and the last thing I want to suggest is that, you know, Sapamo has been at the forefront of thinking of beyond representation and inclusion, but also thinking about plurality uh, and diversities of, of thought systems so that we can get to a place where, you know, we don't want necessarily want a seat at the table, but maybe we want to rebuild the table. Maybe we want to have say in the construction of the material by which we will all gather. Maybe we want to not have a table, but we want to have a dish with one spoon or two, you know. So there's a bunch of ways that I would suggest that if you go back more than a decade to the work that Sapalmo is doing, uh, that um, we, there's lots of important nuggets and tools for us to, to capture as ways to think about moving in a direction of well-being and moving towards doing art for our sake and not necessarily the reproduction of um, 
the neoliberal economy and this moment in late capital. So I will stop there and thank you for having me. <laughs>